This fellow visits with sinners and eats with them. And then he searches until he finds it. And then rejoice with me, for I've found the sheep that was lost. And then a second time, the woman re saying, Rejoice with me, for I found the coin that was lost, that she also searched for until she found it. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm not sure whether you agree with me or not, but I happen to believe, and many join with me, that Luke may be, along with maybe some parts of John, the best storyteller in the New Testament. Luke has so carefully crafted this 15th chapter that you can't miss the point even if you're trying to do so. It starts with being set up. This man fellowships with sinners and eats with them. This is verboten in Jewish culture of Jesus' day, you separated yourself from any persons who were not Jewish. They were Gentiles. They were outsiders. The word most often used for them was dogs. This man eats with sinners. Unheard of. So then Luke lines out two parables for us. The truth of the matter is, he writes a trilogy of parables, and I've never altogether understood how the lectionary writers decide what to read and what not to read. But there are actually three parables that Luke has very methodically laid out and raised the ante for, if you will, until we can't misunderstand anything that he's saying. It's the 15th chapter of Luke from front to back. I think they think, Lutherans can't stand long enough to read a whole chapter. <laughs> but anyway, any time I came upon this story of the lost sheep, I've always stumbled. Because he says, which one of you, having lost a sheep, le wouldn't leave the 99 in the wilderness and search until he finds the lost sheep. Which one of you would not do that? And my, my own kind of crazy little rebellious mind says, most all of them. Because the wilderness is a dangerous place. And sheep are not, not well, they're almost blind. I know what that feels like, always been. They're also not very bright. I think I'll check into that category as well. <laughs> so they tend to wander off. They're known to eat grass right to the edge of a cliff and eat it right over the cliff and gone. So the shepherd leaves 99 unprotected, does he? To search for the one until he finds it, no matter how long it takes, and I just can't somehow get through that. A great colleague of mine in Lancaster, the Reverend Dr. Wallace E. Fisher, who took Trinity Church from about 300 to about 13,000 at one point in its history, uh, once said, but you've got to remember, Ted, parables always limp a little bit. And what Wallace was saying was, the parable is told for one reason and one reason alone. And that we can't take these side alleyways, well, I'd have to go find an assistant shepherd before I could leave 99 and go after the one that's lost. I can't work out those things because what we're supposed to hear in this parable is the shepherd loves the sheep so much that he goes to search until, big word in this parable, he finds it and all of heaven rejoices and then we get to the second problem with the parable and that is there's more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 who need no repentance. Whoa! Uh, you mean that there are maybe some of us who struggle to live a clean life and that brings no joy in heaven? I can't live with that. That's not the point. The point is that God's love is relentlessly focused at until relentlessly focused 
on recovering the lost. So that all of heaven rejoices, even if just one is recovered. That's the point of the parable. Forget the other questions about management, about the sheep left alone, all those kind of things. Those are the places in which good Dr. Fisher would have said, well, Ted, you know, most parables limp a little bit. What is the central luminous truth? God never gives up in his hunger for our salvation. Amen? Amen. All right, then we go to parable two. Parable two is all like the woman who lost a coin. It wasn't worth much money. We can speculate about what the coin was. We can say it might have been part of her, her marital headdress, which was a treasure all of her life, which was made up of valuable coins. Maybe that was it. Who knows? We don't need to know that. She sweeps the floor till she finds it. I'll tell you something that isn't there. In an Israelite home in the first century, the floor was not made of Armstrong tile. It was not made of Bruce hardwood floors. It was beaten earth. And it doesn't rain much there. And the windows, when it does, are not very large. And that floor dries out. And the dirt gets dusty. And it rises in the air. And it's just, well, it's miserable. So you cover the floor with reeds and grasses to make the floor soft. Can you imagine sweeping a floor with reeds and grass? It is looking for the proverbial needle in a haystack, but she does it until she finds it, and the angels in heaven rejoice. Notice how Luke is building the story. And then we come to the third story. This one is about a lost son. We all know the story, and maybe the writers of the lectionary decided we didn't need to tell that story because we all know it. It's a story called by most people the prodigal son. Not about the prodigal son. It's about, as Helmut Thielke, the late pre German preacher would tell, and theologian would tell us, it's about the waiting father. And you say, but he isn't searching. He's just waiting. But that's not quite true either. There is a hunger in this father as there is a hunger in our Lord's in our Heavenly Father's heart, for the son, dumb, stupid, like the sheep, uh, who's gone away, disgraced the family, spent the fortune that belonged to him, probably coming back with what we know today is all every disease in, on that side. Uh, and he comes home and he has a speech all written. You know, I'm not worthy to be your son. Let me just be a slave. Let me just live here. But... The father ignores the speech. And the father runs out and sees him crossing the brim of the hill at some great distance, as if he's been sitting at the window all this time. And he runs out and he reaches out and he gets to his son and he throws his arms around him and he says, Rejoice with me because my son who was dead is now alive again. And then he yells to the servants, Bring a fine robe. Bring the ring for his finger, which is a sign of authority. Bring shoes for his feet, sandals for his feet. You remember the African-American spiritual, all God's children got shoes. It was a sign of sonship. Rejoice with me, for my son who was dead is alive again. First it was a sheep, then it was a cherished coin. Now it's a son. And now it's not a shepherd. And now it's not a woman looking for a coin. It's the father hungering for his son to come home. Nearer and nearer Luke takes us to understanding that it's not about the shepherd. That's about God too. It's not about the woman. That's about God too. And we finally get to the resolving in the third of the three parables that finish out the chapter 15 of Luke. Presiding Bishop Emeritus Herbert Chilstrom was preaching on this series of parables, but primarily on the one about the shepherd. Now he's been the first presiding bishop of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America for two terms, and then he retired. And he said to this group of pastors, he said, you know, I don't know very much about shepherds, 
And I know even less about sheep. And that wasn't real reassuring to hear that our presiding bishop didn't know about shepherds and sheep. But he said, well, he stopped. And he said, but I know something about the loss of a son. A son had committed suicide. And then he told that he and Corinne, his wife, liked when he was home to walk in a park near their home in the evening. And as they were walking one evening, they saw this younger couple coming up and they looked distraught and they were yelling, but they couldn't understand what they were saying. They were yelling in every direction. And finally they began to hear, Cinder, Cinder, Cinder. And then they met. And the couple almost tearfully explained that Cinder was their little Cocker Spaniel dog. It was like a member of the family. And Cinder, it seemed, had this need to run away. She could dig under a fence. She could jump over a fence. There seemed to be no way Cinder couldn't figure out how to get away. And so they said, we usually find her, but tonight we don't know where she is. Maybe if while you're walking, if you see a little black cocker spaniel, her name is Cinder, call her. So Herb and Corinne went about their walk and they began to look around and yell, Cinder, Cinder, but Cinder didn't come. And then Bishop Chilstrom said, We know about the pain of a loved pet that's lost. We've known that with our children. We've known that in our family. And we hurt for this couple terribly. We know too about a lost son. And we hurt for this couple terribly. And he said, I got to thinking what it is about us. That with all the good things God does for us, with all the generosity God spills upon us, we somehow have this need to dig under the fence or jump over the fence to somehow get away and do our own thing. About 20 years ago, maybe it was 30, there was this popular song that brought people to their feet cheering, I've come to the end of my line. I have virtually no regrets because I did it my way. What is it in us that makes us celebrate doing it our way instead of God's way? Paul wrote, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. God was in this person that visited and shared meals with sinners because God comes looking for us in Christ. And he also invites us to join in that search. Most of us are here because somebody somehow introduced us to Jesus. It was the 14th of November, 1934, when my family brought me to the font. And it was all those days after those 30 days after my birth that they talked to me about Jesus. And members of the congregation talked to me and some said, you ought to be a pastor. All of us have been formed by this awesome process of God seeking us through one another. Trouble is, some researchers some years ago said the average Lutheran invites somebody to church once every 75 years. 
God is just like that couple walking through the park calling cinder, cinder. And he asked us to help him. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.